All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golan from SalesPop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Ian Altman, who is in the Washington, D.C. area today. How are you doing, Ian? John, I've never been finer. Well, once, but other than that one time, this is as good as I get. <laughs> Being here with you, that's it. It's the pinnacle. I, I get, life could be over right after this, and like the bucket list is all checked off. Well, I'm glad to see you're setting the bar so low, Ian, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so Ian's a CEO for over two decades. He founded and grew his own business and services technology companies from zero to over one billion in value. And you also wrote the book Same Side Selling, which is what we want to talk about today. And you can see it in the background there with Ian. So same side selling, Ian, it, it had an interesting concept because you co-authored it. So you got the sales side and you got the procurement buyer side. Exactly. Exactly. So I co-wrote the book with Jack Quarles, and most people guess, based on Jack's last name, Quarles, <laughs> that he was a purchasing and procurement guy for two decades. And what we talk about is the adversarial traps that pit buyer and seller against one another, and what are the things that we can do to make it so that the buyer and seller are on the same side working together. See, instead of having a game or a battle metaphor like most sales methodologies, we take more of a puzzle metaphor that says, hey, look, we're just two people trying to put puzzle pieces together. Where there's a good fit, then we've got something worth talking about. And where the puzzle pieces don't fit, forcing it isn't going to get us there. So, okay, so when when a, a buyer and a seller generally enter into enter, enter into a dialogue, initially there is – there, there is a, there's an exploratory phase and it's all nice, but as it gets further in, because there's the whole idea of negotiating the price comes into their head, it starts to get a little more adversarial as it goes on. How, how can you avoid, uh, how can you set things up from the get-go so you can avoid that happening? Well, there, there, there are a few different things. And so first is focusing on the problem someone's trying to solve rather than what it is that you're trying to sell. So instead of, for example, if, if somebody – whatever somebody is selling, even if they were selling CRM solutions, mm -hmm. instead of saying, hey, at Pipeliner, we're selling CRM, it's look, people come to us because either they have a system that's too cumbersome to use and so people don't use it or they can't track – opportunities so they're they're forgetting to follow up on things they should or somebody leaves their organization and all their knowledge goes out with them they don't have any history of it so those are the kinds of problems that you solve for your clients for example right, sure in in the case of most businesses they they can articulate very well what it is that they do but not so much the problems they solve or if you will the symptoms they treat mm -hmm. so first we want to focus there the second side is that most people in sales, if you think of the buyer-seller journey as a race, the starting block is the initial contact. What do most people call the finish line? Well, most people call it the sale, the contract. Yep. Someone in accounting might say actually getting paid. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it's all focused around closing the deal as opposed to what would your client say is the finish line? Well, the client would probably say it's the results. Mm -hmm. So the way that we focus and shift the focus from price to value is we talk about results. So someone says, gee, I don't know. So your solution is $10,000. That seems like a lot. You know, I understand that. The only way we can do it for less is if we sacrifice some of these results that you told me were important. Right. And my understanding is it's not that if we don't achieve those results, it doesn't matter what you pay. It's not a good deal. Have we overstated the results that you need? Mm. And now the other person says, well, no, I actually need those <laughs> things. Okay. And now we're focusing more on results rather than just on the sale. So part of this is then that the salesperson of today certainly needs to be more educated in terms of understanding business, uh, the business of their buyer, the business of business. So being able to focus on those business outcomes as opposed to just learning everything they can about their, their product. And that puts, that puts an onus on the salesperson to educate themselves a little more about business, right? Well, yeah, if you think about it, the the... I, I think of it this way is people in sales fall into one of three personas. Mm -hmm. You're either an order taker, a stereotypical salesperson, or a subject matter expert. So the order taker is the person who the client calls up and the client says, hey, look, here's what I need. How much is it? When can you deliver it? The salesperson believes their job is to sell whatever it is they have to sell, whether the client needs it or not. Right. And the subject matter expert is the person the client would actually pay to meet with if that's what it took to tap into their expertise. Mm. Well, the order taker, if they, have, if they haven't already been in many industries, they've been replaced by Amazon. Mm -hmm. Because 
you know, there are places in the world where you and I could start this discussion. I could order something on Amazon, and shortly after our discussion is done, the item will arrive. So that's pretty tough to compete with, usually sure. at the best price available. Yeah. So now we have the salesperson and the subject matter expert. It doesn't matter which one you think you are. If you're the client, who do you want to deal with? Well, for What's sure. What's the subject matter expert? So if we know that, we need to come across as an expert on their business. And to do that, we need to understand what drives their decision. So I've done research with over 10,000 CEOs and executives. Mm -hmm. We have this in the book on how they make and approve decisions. So everything we talk about in same side selling is aligned with how business executives make and approve decisions, not aligned with how we think we want to sell it. And so that's a, you raise an interesting point there, uh, because I'm not sure that a lot of salespeople really do understand the decision-making process that, that uh, customers go through and executives go through. So that would be really interesting if maybe you just uh, illuminate us on a couple of different areas or different ways that they make decisions that maybe aren't that obvious to, sure, sure. to your average salesperson. Absolutely, John. And, and I will tell you that the top performers know this stuff really sure. well. And the people who are struggling, not as well. So it, what I do is I put people through this scenario and I say, look, someone on your team comes to you. They want to spend $20,000 on this fictitious thing. Mm -hmm. What are the five questions you'd have to have answered to be comfortable making an informed decision to either approve or deny that request? So I put them in groups of executives. So they, they collaborate on these, on these questions. Then once they think they have their list of five, I say, okay, now you have to narrow it down to your top three. And the funny part is, no matter where I've done this, no matter what size companies they mm -hmm. are, I get the same three questions every time. And the questions come down to this. The first question is kind of a compound question. What problem does this solve mm -hmm. or why do we need it? They don't ask what is it. They don't ask yeah. how it works. They don't ask what's the warranty. They ask what problem does it solve or why do we need it? The second question they ask is, so assuming we bought this, what's the likely result or outcome we're going to realize mm -hmm. from making this purchase? And the distant third in all this is what are the alternatives to doing this? Can we do it ourselves? Can we yeah. keep what we current have, currently have and what do we give up accordingly? So if we know that, then instead of starting with here's what we offer, mm -hmm. what we should start with is here's the problems we solve and yeah. why people tell us they need what we have. Mm -hmm. And then once we pique their interest, we say, oh, and, and, and if that piqued your interest, here are the results that our other clients have told us that they get and why they've selected us over other alternatives. And now what I've just done is I've given them information that's directly aligned with how they make decisions. So there's a concept we talk about in same side selling called the same side pitch. Right. And the model of the same side pitch is entice, disarm, and discover. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking somebody what keeps you up at night, <laughs> and, and the problem with that is that you never know what the answer is. So if yeah, you yeah. ask me, hey, and what keeps you up at night? I might say, well, my dog licks himself. Yeah. <laughs> You don't have an answer for that. <laughs> yeah. So now we're stuck. But instead, if I say, well, gee, when I work with companies like yours, they usually come to us with one of two or three problems. Mm -hmm. They either have this problem, this problem, or that problem. So that's the entice part. Then, and, I, then, I share pro then I share that we solve those with great results. I say our clients tell us that we make those problems go away and everything, everything ends up being great for them. They see explosive growth. Mm -hmm. But, and here's the disarm, the way we solve that isn't the right fit for everyone. I don't yet know if we can help you, but if solving that's important, I'm happy to learn more to see whether or not we might be able to help. So that's that entice, disarm, and discover. And it makes it so we're showing up as someone who's there to solve, not someone who's there to sell. Yeah, what I like about that is also you have worked with the prospect there to together to kind of create a picture of what success looks like and therefore you've now set something up for them to compare their current state with right so Absolutely. that they can they can then sell that to whoever they need to sell that to internally because they can say this is where we could be this is where we are now and there's the delta and, and in fact when you have competition one of the big challenges that people will come to me and they say look one of the problems we have is that they compare us to people who shouldn't even be in the mix right and when your prospect doesn't know the difference between what you offer and what someone else offers, it's not their fault. It's mm -hmm. our fault. Right. So when that happens, how do we pivot that? So it's something that I refer to as the client vision pyramid. The client vision pyramid says, gee, when people are looking for a relationship with a vendor in this area, they're usually looking at one of three levels. At the base level is what we call the effective level. And those people do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. The next level is what we call the enhanced level. 
they provide X, Y, and Z plus A and B. At the highest level, the pinnacle of our industry, that's what we call the engage level. That's where they get A, B, and C, A and or X, you know, X, Y, and Z, A and B, and these other five things that are almost the intangibles mm. that make the difference in moving forward where they're totally aligned with what you're trying to accomplish. So which level are you looking for? And the yeah. prospect says, well, I'm, I'm looking for engaged. <laughs> oh. So wh what category would you put your current provider in? Yeah. Oh, they're effective. And now they just acknowledge the difference mm -hmm. without you having to do it. Yeah, it's it's very interesting as we getting back to what we talked about earlier, which means being the subject matter expert and really understanding your industry. To do that, then you have to understand your competitors, etc. But the other thing, and I like this because it's on the cover of your book, is how integrity and collaboration drive extraordinary results. So talk to me a little bit about the integrity piece, because I, I think that's really critical if you are going to be seen as a subject matter expert and if you're going to have long term relationships and to have integrity means that you have to at times you know, maybe walk away or say as you said this is not the right fit for you yeah and it's it's a difficult thing because you have a rep who says man i gotta hit my numbers mm -hmm. and this client seems willing to buy what we have but i don't really know if we can deliver the results well if you can't i promise you that client would be the bane of your existence mm -hmm. and they will suck you into the vortex of evil. <laughs> um, it just, it just becomes a toxic client. Mm -hmm. And then of course they badmouth you to everybody else. Mm -hmm. So yeah. although on the surface, it seems like any sale is a good sale. It just isn't so. And so what we have to do is make sure that we're asking the right questions so that we have a mutual understanding of what they're trying to solve and what the results need to look like. Then we have to do some soul searching to make sure that we feel we're the best people to solve that. I deliver keynote addresses all around the world, and I had a company contact me and said, we have this event. It's 500 of our top performing women in sales and would like you to see if you're available to keynote it. And I said to her, I said, you know, I'm really flattered that you're calling about this. Let me ask you a question. Do you think your audience would respond better to a female speaker rather than a male speaker? Mm -hmm. I, I said, I, I'd be flattered to do it, but if you consider that, she said, you know, you're the first person who mentioned it. I said, oh, okay. Um, you know, the other people you talked to, were they, were they, you know, kind of a mixture of men and women? No, in fact, now that I think about it, it's all men. I mm -hmm. said, okay, are you open to me suggesting a couple of other speakers who are women right. who might be a great fit? And, uh, you know, people would say to me, oh, but you passed on this great opportunity. I said, you know what? I know that their audience is going to be better served by if it's all women in business to have a guy speak just seems kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, several months later, they contacted me and said, Hey, we have this other event with our entire team. Instead of 500 people, it's like 6,000. Are you available on this date? Yeah. Now I didn't know that was going to happen, mm -hmm. but I had, I had to have enough humility to say, I'm probably not the best person to help them in this unique situation. Yeah. And it takes a lot to walk away from standing in front of 500 women at once. Right. <laughs> but yeah but exactly the point there is is you 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 had the conversation with integrity and you were genuinely looking out for the client and their success so that it could be the best possible and then it came back to you as you say you didn't know it's going to come back to you but it came back to you exactly but it's it's that it's kind of that law of attraction is almost like the more you do things like that, the bigger the chances of things coming back to you anyway. And the more your reputation is going to spread as being somebody that say you, know, you can call Ian because he'll have an honest conversation with you. Yeah. And, and you can, if you do this with the expectation that something is going to come back, it won't. Mm -hmm. If you're just genuinely looking out for someone else's best interest, they can tell that. And it builds trust in my prior business we would get phone calls from clients who would say, hey, what's the best such and such we should buy? And then they would pause and say, and I know you don't sell it, but I know right. you'll point us to the people who are the best resource for getting it. Yeah. And once you get to the point that people call you, even when it's not what you sell, you know that you've built enough trust that those people will buy from you. You know, They'll buy chewing gum from you if, <laughs> if you happen to offer it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it's a great point. And and as you said earlier, this is what differentiates you from the rest. You're the subject matter expert. You're the 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 vaunted trusted advisor, right? At this stage, you've you've made the exactly. crossover to that. So what are what are some of the other common pitfalls that uh, salespeople can avoid uh, when they're engaged, especially your early stages with the with the client? 
Well, so one of the biggest traps that people fall into is how they qualify opportunities and how they determine if a meeting was successful. Mm. So your typical your typical person in sales meets with a client, they come back and they say, oh, John, I had the best meeting. Let me tell you about it. Mm-hmm. The meeting was supposed to only last 20 minutes. And instead it lasted an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and the meeting, man, as soon as we got together, man, we just clicked. And we agreed that the meeting went so well that next, next week we're going to meet again. again. Mm-hmm. And that would be a great way to describe a successful meeting that was set up on an online dating site. <laughs> exactly. But it's not a great way to evaluate a good business meeting. So we developed a structure. It's on page 76 of the printed mm-hmm. copy of Same Side Selling called the Same Side Quadrants. Mm-hmm. And we have these journals available on Amazon, but candidly, people can do this on their own, which is on a blank sheet of paper, you draw a vertical line down the center of the page, horizontal line across the page, creating these four quadrants. It's a method for taking notes and meetings to make sure you focus on the right things. In the upper left, we focus on the issue. In essence, Mm -hmm. what problem are they trying to solve? Tying back to the questions that Mm -hmm. executives ask. In the upper right quadrant, we take notes about the impact and the relative importance of solving that, meaning what happens if you don't solve it? Or Mm -hmm. put another way, why do we need it? Which is, once again, one of the questions that people ask. In the lower left quadrant, we take notes about the results or what does success look like for them so we can evaluate together if it's worthwhile. And then in the lower right quadrant, we take notes about who else needs to be impacted or who else needs to be involved, who else is impacted, who else would have an opinion about the results. If you capture your notes that way, you know just by glancing at the sheet of paper, first, if you forgot to cover one of the quadrants, Mm -hmm. and second, you will have laser-focused vision about which opportunities are real and which ones aren't. Yeah. And instead of, oh, we had a great meeting because we got along, you're going to walk out of there and say, you know what? The impact of not solving this is X dollars per month for them. And the results, if we get this thing right for them, equates to you know, 5X. Gee, the delta between those is 6X. If I have a solution that's less than 6X, I know it's worth it for them. Mm-hmm. And you will know instantly which opportunities are worth pursuing, which ones aren't. So yeah. in, in same side selling, we profile companies that more than double their growth rate wow. while pursuing 40% fewer opportunities by qualifying, qualifying using this method. And I think that's a great thing that you've just outlined. And I would encourage people to look into it more because I was talking about this, the syndrome of happy years, uh, which is where you have your happy ears on and you sit through <laughs> the meeting and you hear all these things and you come back later and you interpret them through the, 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 the lens of your happy ears. If that's not, yeah, I'm confusing two different parts of your body, but never mind. Uh, and, and you start to say, as you say, oh, it was a great meeting. You say, so do they have a budget? Oh, yeah, yeah, they have. They never told you, but you just surmise exactly. because I'm they sure were so they do, of yeah, course. So yeah. They wouldn't have met with us. They wouldn't have met with us. And the other part, as you say, is, and I've got a follow up meeting next week. And then you ask, oh, and then you ask oh. the, then you ask that horrible question. You go, and what are they doing between now and next week? What do you say? What do you mean? What What is They're the buyer counting doing? The hours till they yeah. see me again. <laughs> so, so basically, you haven't moved this forward one iota because they ain't taking any action between now and next week. There's no follow up actions, right? <laughs> Exactly. Oh, yeah, there is that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, Ian, in the last few moments that we have here, is there anything else you'd like to highlight about the book and then tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can learn more about you? You know what? So the first thing is that the book, throughout the book, every single chapter has something we call the buyer's perspective. So it's as we're describing things, it's here's what you may think is a seller, mm-hmm. but here's what's actually going through the buyer's mind, because Jack has spent two decades work, working with executives and procurement officials on how they buy things. So he will say, you're often thinking this, they're thinking that. For example, one of the ones in the book is, you mention all these big clients you work for because you think you're impressing the um, the prospect. Mm-hmm. And the prospect thinks, wow, we're, much, we're a lot smaller. These guys are probably too big for us uh-huh. and we're not going to get their attention. Mm-hmm. So you think that it's great news. They think it's a red flag. Um, and then outside of that, there's there's bonus material on samesideselling.com. So there are numerous case studies and other tools that are there that are free for people to use. And um, and people can reach me at ianaltman.com. And a lot of people are surprised that when they send me a note on LinkedIn or they send an email to me that they actually get a response from me. And I, I live for that kind of stuff. So people can feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, mention your podcast, 
and um, I'm happy to connect with people and see how we can help them. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ian. And again, I would recommend this book, and especially as you said, because you've got the both sides of the uh, of the equation here. And let's face it: for most salespeople, they prefer to get a a visit from Freddy Krueger than a procurement person. Uh, <laughs> so I think learning learning more about who's on the other side of the table is always a good thing. Uh, so again, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. Ian Altman, this has been tremendous. Uh, I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.